Well, welcome to our series, uh, back to our series, Jesus People. Pastor Rich did a great job last week. And can we welcome the Prison Church Network and the ladies and the men now at Napa State on the stream, all locations. Uh, we have a lot of live preaching going on at our campuses, so I'm not sure who's tapped in today, but if you're with us, I love you, and we're believing God to speak to you today, all right? Now, in this series, uh, Jesus People, we're showing some clips from a series called The Chosen. If you haven't seen it, do yourself a favor and check it out. Here's a link uh, that you will be able to go to, and there's a QR code on the app and on the website and where you can take in the whole episode that we're going to tap into for a few minutes in the message today. So in this series, Jesus People, here's what we're doing. We're looking at the ministry years of Jesus. He did no ministry until he was 30 years old. And for the next three and a half years, he changed the world. God himself walked on this planet and he loved on people and he did miracles and healed the sick and opened blinded eyes and stopped some funeral processions and raised some people from the dead. He healed lepers, he preached the kingdom, he impacted people. And so we're looking at the miracles and the moments where Jesus would spend time with an individual and taking principles from those moments and applying them to us, the church, because you are now Jesus' people, amen? And so we're learning, and today we're gonna look at an encounter that Jesus had with a Samaritan woman. And many of you would know this story from John chapter four, but this was one messed up lady. She had a bad reputation. She had bounced from one re um, relationship to the next, and um, her life was probably marked by shame, definitely rejection. It would be the cool of the day where the ladies in the, in the east would get up in the morning and they would all go together to the well to get water, but she had to go in the middle of the day alone as to avoid the persecution and the ridicule that would come because of her lifestyle. Now understand this, it's hard for us to wrap our minds around the reproach and the shame that was connected with a lady that was in perpetually a different relationship and adultery. We don't share that in our, let's call it, uh, post-Christian, hedonistic, morally bankrupt culture that is America in 2022. Did I just say all that? Well, it's truth, own it. We need a moral revolution, don't we? Need revival. But just saying that, the, the shame, it's hard for us to understand this. Every day was the same for her. She would get up and try to avoid people. She would go out to that well in the heat of the day and she would live with a brokenness. And, you know, I think she was just looking for what we're all looking for. And that is a relationship that will satisfy unconditional love and a life of meaning. Instead, she lived a life of brokenness and every day started to blend together until one morning Jesus gets up and he tells the boys, his disciples, he said, today we need to go through Samaria. Now, there was something that happened in that moment. I believe there would have been confusion. There would have been pushback from the disciples because many of you know that for Jewish people, Samaria was a no-travel zone. It was a no-fly zone. There was a deep-seated hatred, animosity, prejudice, angst between the Jews and the Samaritans. In fact, so much so that the Jewish people labeled them as mongrels, heathen idol worshipers, half-breeds, pagans, and I'm sure the Samaritans had some colorful adjectives as well that they would call the Jewish people. This was a mutual hatred, and, and so um, the Jewish people were so convinced that they were corrupt and contaminated that they wouldn't even set foot on their property. They would take the long way around Samaria to go from Jerusalem up to the Galilee, especially a priest. A priest would not be defiled by being on the ground of a Samaritan person, much less talk to a woman from Samaria, much less talk to a woman with this kind of reputation. There's something about our Jesus. He breaks up the religious program, doesn't he? And he gets out of bed and he says, today I need to go through Jerusalem. I need to know this about the Lord, that." When Jesus walked this earth and did his ministry, he lived on assignment. And that's a model for you and me. We're just not randomly bouncing through life. Your life is not just a string of coincidences or whatever happens tomorrow. No, you are called by the Spirit to be led by the Spirit to impact people for eternity. Now, Jesus, when he became the God-man, he gave up some of his power and uh, his actual God uh, attributes, and he humbled himself. 
uh, it says in Philippians that he took upon him the form of a servant and he gave up his privileges. So get this, if you, if you don't understand this about Jesus, uh, he became a man and so his, he was limited by his own decisions. For instance, God is omnipresent, isn't he? That means he's everywhere all the time. And Jesus was God in the flesh and fully God. But as he became man, he gave up his omnipresence. It says of God in the word that if you uh, climb the highest mountain, he's there. If you make your bed in hell, he's right there. There's nowhere you can go that God has not already been there. He's there and he's there when you leave. In fact, some of you who were at the club last night, God was there, busted. No, no, no condemnation. I just want you to know he was there. So Jesus could not be everywhere all the time. He was one place at one time. Another thing that Jesus pushed back and relinquished the privilege of is omniscience. So he didn't know everything all the time about everybody. Here's what Jesus did. He came out of the wilderness in the power of the Holy Spirit and he operated in the fullness of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus would operate in words of knowledge, words of wisdom, prophecy, faith, healing, because the fullness of the Holy Spirit was flowing through his life. But he got his marching orders in the morning. The pattern of Jesus' life, and Pastor Rich mentioned this last week, disciples you know, wake up, you know, snoring, yawning, and look around, where's Jesus? He was the same place he was yesterday, in a solitary place seeking the Father. He would get up early in the morning, and he would seek God, and he would come out of that time with his marching orders, with a clear direction for the day. Look at this. He said it this way in John 5. Jesus said, very truly, I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself. He can do only what he sees the father doing, because whatever the father does, he does, excuse me, the son does also. So I want you to know that that's a model for us. You can live on assignment. Spend time with God in the morning because there's somebody that's waiting by the well. There's a broken person in your workplace, your school, in your neighborhood. There's people that, never forget this, as a, as a Christ follower, as Jesus people, you have what people need. You are carrying, if you are born again, have the Holy Spirit in your life, you are carrying life, this river of living water that people are so desperate for. And if the church will live on assignment, we can have some divine appointments that will change people's eternity. That's what we're called to do. I also love the fact that when Jesus changed up his travel plans that day, um, this lady had no idea what was coming. Think about it. She's just gonna get up one more day, hide from the crowd, sneak out to the well by herself. Little did she know that Messiah was gonna engage. There was a moment. This should encourage many of you today. If you feel like you're alone, God doesn't know where you're at, you're just going through the same motions, I believe the Holy Spirit is gonna intersect your path and there's gonna be a divine appointment. Who knows, this could be your day to meet the man Christ Jesus, amen? So I wanna read the story, okay, and the actual historic account from the book of John chapter four. I'm gonna read that to you and then we're gonna watch the artist rendering a clip that uh, for me personally just moves me and I get a glimpse of the compassion and the character of Jesus. Let us go to the word, John chapter four. Verse one, Jesus knew the Pharisees had heard that he was baptizing and making more disciples than John, though Jesus himself didn't baptize them, his disciples did. So he left Judea, excuse me, and returned to Galilee but he needed to go through Samaria. Eventually, he came to the Samaritan village of Sychar near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat wearily beside the well about noontime. Soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, please give me a drink. He was alone at the time because the disciples had gone to the village to buy some food. The woman was surprised, for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, you're a Jew, I'm a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? And Jesus replied, if you only knew the gift God has for you and who you're speaking to, you would ask me and I would give you living water. But sir, you don't have a rope or a bucket. This well is very deep. Where would you get this living water? Besides, do you think you're greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than he and his sons and his animals enjoyed? And Jesus replied, anyone who drinks this water, probably pointing at the well, will soon become thirsty. 
But those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh, bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. Now, I believe right here in this moment, the atmosphere shifts. Something changes her desire to hear more. The Holy Spirit is actively working in this broken lady in the moment. She says, please, sir, give me this water. Then I'll never be thirsty again. I won't have to come here to get water. And Jesus said, well, go get your husband. I don't have a husband, the woman replied. Jesus said, you're right. You don't have a husband, for you've had five husbands. You aren't even married to the man you're living with now. You are certainly speaking the truth. Sir, the woman said, you must be a prophet. So tell me, why is it Jews insist we worship, uh, excuse me, that Jerusalem is the only place of worship while Samaritans claim it's here at Mount Gerizim where our ancestors worship? And Jesus replied, believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans know very little about the one you worship while we Jews know all about him for salvation comes through the Jews. But the time is coming. Indeed, it's here now when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who worship him in that way. For God is spirit. So those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know the Messiah is coming, the one who is called Christ. And when he comes, he'll explain everything to us. Then Jesus told her, I am the Messiah. This is a moment right here. This is a moment. Well, just then lunch shows up. Disciples come back and they're stunned. They're shocked to find him talking to a woman. None of them had the nerve to say, what are you doing with her? Why are you talking to her? The woman left her water jar beside the well, ran back to the village telling everyone, Come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? So the people came streaming from the village to see him. Whoo! Now I know that's a film production. It's an artist rendering that captured this, but I think you sense and feel the, the weight in the heart of Jesus. I think they've captured somewhat of the persona of Jesus and To know Jesus is to know this person of deep compassion and forgiveness and love and understanding. Uh, Now, some of you Bible people, you realize that there was some embellishment there at the end of the story. Uh, They took some artistic license. Uh, Two things, we're not using the chosen films to build a doctrinal uh, thesis, okay? But also consider this, it's not much of a stretch. When she walked back to the village or ran back to the village, she yelled out, come see a man who told me everything I've ever done. Think about that. Now, we have about three minutes of dialogue in John chapter 4, but those who've studied uh, the topography of the area and the trip and what it took to gather lunch at a village back then would say that it it was at least about an hour and a half to two hours that Jesus was alone at that well. All that to say the conversation was much more in depth than the few verses in the soundbite we have uh, there in John chapter 4. I want to give you just a couple observations today about this moment. There is so much in this chapter, but there's a couple things that we can take away for ourselves personally and as Jesus people. Number one is this, as Jesus people, join Jesus in calling up those who've been knocked down. Call up those who've been knocked down. This lady was not just low on the social scale in the Jewish mindset, but among her own people. She was despised, rejected, the lowest of the low. Isn't it not ironic, but profound and prophetic that Jesus goes to this broken woman to reveal that he is Messiah? This is the first person on the planet to hear, I am the Messiah. What does that say about God? He doesn't go to the religious high towers. He doesn't go to those with the degrees and the pedigrees and and the church reputations. He goes to broken, messed up people and he reveals who he is. Come on, how many of you love Jesus? And he calls up those who've been put down. Now, here's what Jesus does and I wanna appeal to you to do the same. He calls out the potential in people and the nobility in people. People, all of us here in the room, we have a tendency to speak to our limitations to recognize our own current reputation or our failure, and we do it quite proficiently with others. We judge others based on their flaws and their failures and their track record, and God knows all about that. But he doesn't point out your brokenness to shame you, condemn you, or cause you to experience despair. 
this, he was operating in the gifts at the well and the word of knowledge about, hey, you've had five husbands, you're shacking up with your boyfriend. He didn't say that to condemn or shame, but simply to open up her heart to the message of truth. So can we be a little more like Jesus in not calling out people's brokenness and failure, but calling out the nobility in people, call out the potential, call out the gifting that's still in there. And I believe the Holy Spirit will help us to do that, especially right now in a culture you live in that's really mastered the art of put downs through memes and uh, just cynical attitudes and criticisms, and not just in political arenas, but across the board. Everybody's judging everybody and going after everyone. What do you say as Jesus people, we intentionally begin to call up the nobility in others? Let me ask you a personal question. Who are you calling up? Who are you looking at and say, hey, I know you've been through some, some things, but I see something in you. <laughs> When I was a young worship leader, I didn't share this in the other service, but it just comes to my mind. I was a little bit discouraged, and I, I was at a conference in Dallas, Texas, and I was young into the game and all this, and a worship leader, nationally known recording artist guy at the time, I was singing backup, I was singing tenor on stage, and he just came over to me, and he had, he had a word of, of knowledge, a prophetic word, and he said, Dave, he said, you're going to be amazed at what God's going to do in your life and ministry. And he began to speak into something he saw that I didn't see. But that one moment, you'd be surprised how much mileage I got, faith mileage, off of one prophetic word where someone sees in you what no one else sees. Where they look at you and say, yeah, I know you've been through some stuff, but let me tell you what God has for you in the future. Every time you call someone up, you take on the role of the love of the Father. You become Jesus people representing Jesus in that moment. Another thing we can do as Jesus people is join Jesus in honoring those who've been dishonored. The Hebrew and the Greek word to honor, it, it contains these words, respect, credibility, to have weight, to have authority. And Jesus placed that weight and authority and respect upon this broken lady. Think about it. Up until this day, her reputation was adulterous or whatever, you know, slang vernacular they had back in that era to describe who she was. I'm sure there's plenty of words. But after this day, it all changed. Now she's no longer the adulteress down the street. Who is she? She's the woman who came and told us about Messiah. She's the one who took us out to the well that day. It says she took the whole village. They streamed out to see him. And Jesus delays his trip to the Galilee and preaches the kingdom for two days. And many people come to faith. So in one moment of honor, she's taken from disreputation to an amazing reputation. From being some obscure woman who's despised to now a person who is respected in the community. And God says, church, you have the ability to put honor upon one another. Look at this in Romans 12. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring one another. Respect one another. Say great things about one another. Call one another up. And I love this. The, the verb tense here in the Greek means this to place a value based on a price that was paid. Let me just say something over you today. Your value is not based on your performance. Your value is not based on what you've accomplished or what you have not accomplished. Your value is not based on what you've amassed or your failures or your reputation. What is your value based on? The price that was paid for you. Let me remind you, this is what honoring is. It's looking at you and saying, oh, okay, you're a big deal. You know why? You know the price that was paid for you? The precious blood of Jesus. It says in Corinthians that you've been bought at a high price, a precious price. So honor God with your life. See, when I start looking at people, not based on their track record, their reputation, or their failure, but I look at them and I think, here's one who Jesus died for. Here's one he shed his blood for. Here's one he thought so much of and valued them so greatly that he would give the most precious gift and that was his own life. When we see people through the eyes of Jesus, it's easy to honor. What if, what if the church was disseminating honor, calling up nobility, calling up greatness out of people? Getting up in the morning and praying, and then operating the gifts of the Spirit and speaking over people's lives. Oh, this is how Jesus is glorified in the earth. It's how he's glorified in his church. I'm a little bit excited about it. 
And the final one today in our final few minutes is this truth, and it's a revelation in John 4. It was this. We're called to worship in spirit and truth. In spirit and truth. Basically, it means this. By the power of the Holy Spirit, this, this wellspring that Jesus spoke of that never diminishes, it keeps flowing, it increases. It's the Holy Spirit in us that glorifies Jesus and in truth. That means according to what the Bible says about worship and with pure hearts, no religious facade. You see, in that moment, by that well, Jesus redefines Samaritan and Jewish understanding of worship for all time and eternity. Now, you as church people, as Bible people, as Father's House people, you're familiar with this concept, worship in spirit and truth. And if you've been coming here any length of time, we say this quite frequently, is the church is not stages and lights and buildings and screens and classrooms, you are the church. And we could gather in a field or under a tree or at a theater or a community center, we've done it all. And in that moment, in that place, we are the church. This was a revelation to them. Their understanding of worship is, you go to the temple, you go to Mount Zion, you go to Mount Gerizim to worship. You go to the synagogue. It's all about a building. Sad to say, a lot of people are still living with that concept. They think worship is, I walk into the Father's house building. I walk into Roseville or East Bay or Napa or go to the uh, Prison Church Network gathering there in the chapel and now I'm worshiping. Being in a place of worship does not make you a worshiper. I've used this analogy. Going to church doesn't make you a worshiper any more than spending the night in your garage makes you an automobile, okay? And Jesus is saying there's a heart connection that he longs for, and so this is a revelatory moment here by the well, and I have some good news. I wanna call up the band, we'll shift gears here in a little bit. That if you're seeking God, if you're feeling like, man, Dave, I just feel distant, and I don't feel like God hears my prayers. And I feel like, you know, I know about God and I go to church, but I feel like, you know, those people that hear his voice are way over there and I'm back here in the cheap seats. Let me read you once again this one verse. A time is coming and now has come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers, what? That the Father seeks. He's actually seeking worshipers who will open up their heart and worship in spirit and truth. What we're gonna do at all locations in, in just a moment is this. I'm gonna give you a moment to do this. Now, if you're here and you're a guest and you're a visitor and this already feels awkward, there's no pressure. You can just relax and watch Christ followers worship and stay in your seat or stand, whatever you wanna do. But we're simply going to take a moment to make a place and a space if you've never done this. Now here's a key to worshiping in spirit and truth. Jesus was sitting one day teaching and you know all the Pharisees and the lawmakers are criticizing him and figuring out how they're gonna kill him. And right in the middle of his speech, all these little kids run up, toddlers. You know how toddlers are. And there was something about Jesus, they're jumping on his lap and the parents are saying, hey, lay your hands on my baby and bless him and bless my three-year-old. And this ticked off the religious guys and they're like, hey, get the kids out of here. Get them away from the Messiah. And what did Jesus say? Unless you become like one of these little children, you can't enter the kingdom. Now, what are some attributes of a toddler? Obviously, they have pure hearts, they're innocent, they're naive to evil, there's a lot of qualities, but here's one I want you to get. They actually don't care what you think. They really don't. A three-year-old is not worried about your opinion when they walk into the room, right? They scream, cry, interrupt, they're just like, they're not even thinking about you. One of the most debilitating factors in true worship is our self-awareness and intimidation. We're so worried about opinion. We're so worried about what others think if, if we worship according to biblical truth. Biblical truth is sing a new song to the Lord. Sing in the spirit. Sing with understanding. Lift up holy hands without wrath, wrath and doubting. Bow down before him. Lift up a shout of praise. There's nine psalmic ways of worship and religion just chokes all that down to people standing in a room quite reverently while the monks chant in the distance, oh, monopogmio. It's called the dark ages, do your homework. New Testament worship is we're free to bless the Lord. We're free to lift our voices. So I'm a three on the Enneagram, you probably don't care. And that's back, so I know it's so 2019, and for some it's witchcraft, but anyway. 
If you do your homework, part of me is, uh, you know, I'm a people pleaser. You know, I want to make sure you like me and I want to make sure the house is right and the air conditioner is right and the sound's right. And I just want you to have a good time. I don't want any enemies. That's part of the way I'm, I'm made up. And that can be a deterrent for a worshiper. Because if I'm more concerned with what you think than what Jesus thinks of me, I've just missed the heart of true worship. Share this one more story as as a worship pastor in Huntington Beach many, many moons ago. And I I used to lead worship with a blue Stratocaster and a mullet, but don't hold it against me. It was a moment in time. And I remember I'm, I'm standing at this church and I'm leading, I'm leading, I exalt thee. I remember the song. And the Holy Spirit says, I want you to bow right now, kneel on the stage. Well, this particular church, that was not one of their expressions. They weren't a bowing, kneeling group. And so I'm having a a, a full-on dialogue with the Lord. Well, for thou, O Lord, art high. And under my breath, I'm going, God, I can't kneel down. They're not going to hear my voice in the microphone. I'm the worship leader. As if I'm giving him information that's a revelation to God himself. (laughs) Right? I'm like, and you know, Lord, they don't kneel in this place. They don't do that. And I missed the moment. I, and of course, there's more on-ramps to lead people into the presence of God. But I remember going home grieved that day because I was more concerned what they thought of me and my worship leading prowess than I was the, being obedient to the Holy Spirit. And so you probably noticed this. Many times when I'm preaching up here, off and on as the Holy Spirit leads me, I just like to kneel down. I like to get low and kneel before him. It reminds me of something. I love you, still a people pleaser, want to make you happy, but compared to being obedient, I just don't care that much what you think. In comparison, don't, it's not, not trying to offend you. This is true worship. When the word says to lift up holy hands or to lift up your voice, or maybe the Holy Spirit will whisper to you to to bow and kneel before me or go lay hands on someone, whatever the Holy Spirit is leading. And when we worship in spirit and truth, something happens, we engage with Jesus. It's no longer religion. It's not about a mountain, a temple, a label, a title. It's this living water that begins to flow 